suicide prevention megathread with the news today of the passing of the amazing Anthony Bourdain and the also the very talented Kate Spade a couple of days ago, we decided to create a megathread about suicide prevention. So many great and talented people have left the world by way of suicide, not just those are famous, but friends and family members of everyday people that's why we would like to use this thread for those that have been affected by the suicide of someone to tell your story or if you yourself have almost ended your life, tell us about what changed. If you are currently feeling suicidal we'd like to offer some resources that might be beneficial, https colon slash slash www.isp.info slash resources slash crisis underscore centresh ttp www.befrienders.org has global resources and hotlines http www.suicidepreventionlyferline.org get help lifeline chat asks www.samaritans.org how we can help you uk https colon slash slash www.lifeline.org or get help or http colon slash slash www.crisistextline.org www.nami.org learn more mental health conditions related conditions risk of suicide www.thetravorproject.org yaf space caps www.veteranscrisisline.net please be respectful and remember the human while participating in this thread and thank you to everyone that chooses to share their stories the ask reddit moderators Necrokitty says telling users to kill themselves is a violation of Rule 8 and will get you banned. Don't do it. Kagali05 says what sucks a lot for non-celebrities and poorer people is the cost of therapy. I don't currently have insurance and while I know I should go see a therapist about stuff, I can't afford it. I'm sure other people are in that boat for me it isn't so bad these days because I ended up meeting an awesome guy and getting engaged. But I've had a lot of extremely low points in my life where I could have used professional help. Brooksy says as someone who's struggled with suicidal thoughts and still do on occasion I'd like to advise against a trend I've noticed on Reddit, and it's this thing about instantly linking to suicide prevention organizations. I personally understand that it's meant with good intent, but on someone who is suicidal and not quite in their right mind it often has the opposite effect of where it feels like you're being shoved into a corner or dumped as someone else's problem. More often than not someone suicidal wants to talk to a normal person, someone who will care or listen to them, of course I am not telling strangers that you have to be that person, I know it shouldn't be anyone else's responsibility. All I am trying to say is that if you really want to help someone or make them feel better, linking them to something else is not a great way to go about it, it's much better worked into a conversation as a suggestion on the side again. I don't want to come off as a dick here, I think it's great that so many people care enough to want to encourage others to seek help, but try to keep this in mind. That feeling of being pushed away or getting a predictable and generic answer often makes you feel more isolated and more depressed. Liam Mimza says by the way, I wish there was a suicide chat line and not a hotline. I don't like speaking out loud to a person about any issues I might be having. Saucipading says I attempted suicide at 19. I think the hardest thing for non-suicidal people to understand is that a lot of suicidal people don't want to kill themselves, they just want to stop existing. Actually going through the steps of writing a note and taking the pills was extremely difficult and all I kept thinking the whole time was that it would be so much easier if I could just fall asleep and never wake up. It was scary to think that I was potentially killing myself whereas a death I couldn't control or had less control over would just happen. Then there's everyone and everything else to consider. I also have caught myself wishing many times that the whole world would end so that I could stop existing but then neither myself nor my loved ones would have to deal with the pain or miss out on a good life. I found those things really hard to articulate at 19. It's how a lot of depressed people feel. TT 12345 X says a person from my past reaching out to me, even for 5 minutes, does exceptionally more for my mental well-being than seeing 10,000 Redditors spam the numbers for different suicide prevention hotlines. Please, please reach out to the people in your life. You can keep it as light as you want. We're social creatures, and even limited interaction goes a very long way. 
McFly8182 says I did not write this but have permission to share just saw this elsewhere on the internet in reference to recent events. For obvious reasons, at least, for anyone who has had to listen to me bitch about how much I hate winter, it really resonated with me, when you have depression it's like it snows every day some days it's only a couple of inches, it's a pain in the ass, but you still make it to work, the grocery store. Sure, maybe you skip the gym or your friend's birthday party, but it is still snowing and who knows how bad it might get tonight. Probably better to just head home. Your friend notices, but probably just thinks you are flaky now, or kind of an asshole some days it snows a foot. You spend an hour shoveling out your driveway and are late to work. Your back and hands hurt from shoveling. You leave early because it's really coming down out there. Your boss notices some days it snows four feet. You shovel all morning but your street never gets plowed. You are not making it to work, or anywhere else for that matter. You are so sore and tired you just get back in bed. By the time you wake up, all your shoveling has filled back in with snow. Looks like your phone rang. People are wondering where you are. You don't feel like calling them back, too tired from all the shoveling. Plus they don't get this much snow at their house so they don't understand why you're still stuck at home. They just think you're lazy or weak, although they rarely come out and say it some weeks it's a full-blown blizzard. When you open your door, it's to a wall of snow. The power flickers, then goes out. It's too cold to sit in the living room anymore, so you get back into bed with all your clothes on. The stove and microwave won't work so you eat a cold pop tart and call that dinner. You haven't taken a shower in three days, but how could you at this point? You're too cold to do anything except sleep. Sometimes people get snowed in for the winter. The cold seeps in. No communication in or out. The food runs out. What can you even do? Tunnel out of a 40-foot snow bank with your hands. How far away is help? Can you even get there in a blizzard? If you do, can they even help you at this point? Maybe it's death to stay here but it's death to go out there too. The thing is, when it snows all the time, you get worn all the way down. You get tired of being cold. You get tired of hurting all the time from shoveling, but if you don't shovel on the light days, it builds up to something unmanageable on the heavy days. You resent the hell out of the snow, but it doesn't care. It's just a blind chemistry, an act of nature. It carries on regardless, unconcerned and unaware if it buries you or the whole world also, the snow builds up in other areas, places you can't shovel, sometimes places you can't even see, maybe it's on the roof, maybe it's on the mountain behind the house, sometimes, there's an avalanche that blows the house right off its foundation and takes you with it, a veritable act of God, nothing can be done, the neighbors say it's a shame and they can't understand it, he was doing so well with his shoveling, I don't know how it went down for Anthony Bourdain or Kate Spade. It seems like they got hit by the avalanche, but it could have been the long, slow winter. Maybe they were keeping up with their shoveling. Maybe they weren't. Sometimes, shoveling isn't enough anyway. It's hard to tell from the outside, but it's important to understand what it's like from the inside. I firmly believe that understanding and compassion have to be the base of effective action. It's important to understand what depression is, how it feels, what it's like to live with it, so you can help people both on an individual basis and a policy basis. I'm not putting heavy shit out here to make your Friday morning suck. I know it feels gross to read it, and realistically it can be unpleasant to be around it, that's why people pull away I don't have a message for people with depression like keep shoveling, it's asinine, of course you're going to keep shoveling the best you can, until you physically can't, because who wants to freeze to death inside their own house, we know what the stakes are, my message is to everyone else, grab a fucking shovel and help your neighbor, slap a mini snow plow on the front of your truck and plow your neighborhood, Petition the city council to buy more salt trucks, so to speak. Depression is blind chemistry and physics, like snow. And like the weather, it is a mindless process, powerful and unpredictable with great potential for harm. But like climate change, that doesn't mean we are helpless. 
If we want to stop losing so many people to this disease, it will require action at every level edit. Feel free to share this with anyone or anywhere you think it might help. We aren't alone. Even when there's warm bodies around when we are cold we still shiver. Offer a blanket edit too. I just want to say thank you and you're welcome to everyone who is commenting and can relate. You're not alone. Not just me, but many of us truly understand how you feel. But I won't tell you what to do. We who suffer have been told time and again what to do. But if someone offers you a blanket sometimes the warmth can help. Edit 3. I'm trying to comment on everyone that is posting and thanking me for sharing. I think it's important that everyone is acknowledged that took the time to share their thoughts. Everyone matters. Thank you to whomever, whoever, gave me my first gold. And all the gold after. It was absolutely not necessary but very much appreciated. Please share. Thank you. Deosodiosis says I bought a dog. I have a very busy life, so people ask me if I regret having her, since dogs are all high maintenance. I need to walk her a few times a day, feed her, keep her entertained, clean up after her, remove dog hair from everything including myself with an unending supply of lint rollers. I don't regret it. I got her for one purpose that I won't tell them. Because I'm lonely. Because when I'm at my loneliest, I don't have anyone to turn to, no one to go see, to talk to, despite my best efforts. I have her because I know if I died, something would miss me, so I can't leave her. I left her at the dog boarding for an extra day after getting back from a work trip, earlier this week. I found myself calling for her, and she wouldn't come. For the first time in years, I just cried. I missed her. I wanted to sit on the couch and just pet her like she always loves. Fortunately. I could just grab her the next day. But it reminded me how important she is to my mental health. I recently turned down a job that would have required me to move to a place where I would have even less familial and friend support. I would have been traveling most of the year, so I would have to give up my dog. I'm glad I did. I had one friend tell me to absolutely not take the job. He said if I took it, he gave me six months before I jumped off a bridge. I can't say he would be wrong. I used work to redirect my loneliness over the past several years, which ended up making it worse as it alienated me from those that I was close to. And then the company abandoned me, hired someone above me that openly tells people inside and outside of the company that he's trying to fire me. I have the CEO and president behind me, so he can't touch me. They know what I did for the company, my sacrifice, my skill, my dedication and loyalty. I now have much less responsibilities, so I can relax. Now, I'm here with my dog, trying to decompress from my job, make more friends, actually date girls for the first time in many years of unsuccessfully trying. Things are starting to look better. Here's to better days. Agraning Zambi says I work at Poison Control. One of our main jobs is to provide advice to hospitals caring for patients who have overdosed. I will never forget one teenage girl who took an overdose of Tylenol and apparently regretted it shortly afterwards but was afraid of telling anyone. She didn't tell anyone until three days later. She walked into the ER awake and talking and died waiting for a liver transplant. She left behind a heartbroken family and more friends than she realized she had if you come to the hospital within a few hours of taking pills. It can be fixed. Don't be afraid to get the help you need. Clementin Ekroxinsk one says I'm the mother of a toddler who died of cancer. There is nothing anyone could do to prevent me from killing myself besides listening and being present. I didn't reach out to anyone. Being suicidal means you want to die no one could have talked me out of it. My family knew I was struggling and they took shifts watching me. They bought me my favorite foods. Watched RuPaul's Drag Race with me for weeks. Seriously. For some reason it was the only thing I could watch. They listened to me cry and didn't try to give me solutions. They just said I know. We had a code word potato. If I said potato, that meant that I needed someone to be physically present with me, quickly. There was always a plan for the next day tomorrow we're going to have lunch at that Mexican place. Okay, tomorrow let's look for a special garden marker for miles. I think that was a big part of it. 
Having a plan for the next day meant I had to keep going it's been almost 4 months since my 3 year old died and I'm still living. That's pretty fucking amazing. Throw away me dad now says my brother committed suicide when I was 8. He was 15. My dad has been abusive but my brother suffered the most from him. He was my hero. I looked up to him and wanted to be like him. He'd take the fall for me when I did something that would cause my dad to punish me. I remember that morning vividly. I got back from school the previous day and went to go hang out with him in his room but his door was locked. I kept coming back but he wouldn't answer the door. My parents weren't worried because my brother usually kept to himself like that. When it was time for bed I told my dad to see if he could get the door open and he told me not to bother my brother again. After my brother didn't come down for breakfast my father broke his door and we found him hanging from the ceiling. I wish I didn't see that. I screamed the entire time and wouldn't let go of his hand. It felt cold and my mother had to peel me away. He left a suicide note and a handwritten will. He left me his favorite book. I miss you Jeff. Edit. Thank you so much everyone for the love. Edit 2. My dad kept repeating why Jeffrey? Why and tried to get him down from the fan. I was screaming please Jeff and pulling his hand and when my mom couldn't separate our hands she pulled me away. She was crying so hard. I remember kicking my legs in the air and screaming you should have opened his door for me. Edit 3. The book is Animal Farm by George Orwell. I always carry it with me now. Whenever he'd read it to me I'd make fun of how the big words sounded funny and we'd laugh. There wasn't much in his will. He left me the book and his Game Boy. He left my mom his wristwatch. My dad didn't get anything in the will. Edit 4. Wow I woke up to a ton of supportive messages and so much love. Thank you for all your kind words. I've never spoken about the details before and I pray this helps someone who is struggling. To all the Jeffs, I know it's hard but please be strong. You don't want to have your family calling your name and you not answering. It's the most painful thing ever. For years I had nightmares of trying to save him but each time I'd get there too late. In his note he said he was really sorry and didn't mean to hurt any of us but he just couldn't bear the pain anymore. He said he hoped it would make my dad stop being disappointed in him and called me his best bud in the world. He told my mom he loved her and hoped she'd find the courage he didn't have. Thanks to all the gold X4. Biboti says I wish this was up last week. A very close friend of mine committed suicide in the second. She was only 19 and could light up a room when she came in. The worst thing is feeling like I could have stopped her. After work the day before she asked me if I wanted to go out. I didn't because I was tired and had to clean. My heart hurts. Her memorial was yesterday. It's still such a raw wound. I'm sorry I had to get this off my chest edit. Thank you all who've messaged me or replied with support and their own experiences. I know logically it wasn't my fault but emotionally it hurts. I'm slowly starting to accept what happened but it will be a while before I'll be back to normal. Also to the Ashat that messaged me and told me it was my fault. Go fuck yourself. Fish Ariel says almost exactly a year ago one of my best mates called drunk in the middle of the night telling me that he was going to end it, and he wanted to apologize for doing this and thank me for being the only one to support him. I got so fucking scared and started calling people that had been on the same party that he attended earlier and managed to find him nearby walking alone towards the rail tracks. I ran towards him and stopped him. We talked for almost five hours straight that night. We agreed for him to try therapy. It worked. At least for him, and now he is on his way back up pursuing a career in graphic design. I urge everyone who feels depressed at least try to talk to someone, your family, friends or a therapist hotline as it might help more than you think. Lizzie Free says my mom killed herself on April 22nd of this year. My dad found her naked, fallen off the side of the bed, with three empty pill bottles, two knives, and a razor. She was covered in vomit. The ambulance came, but she was unresponsive. They waited until I arrived to ask if they could stop resuscitation attempts, which they tried to do for over an hour. We went in when they stopped. She was half covered with a sheet. There was a lot of blood and vomit. Her ribs were broken from resuscitation attempts. She was just gone. My dad and I are totally lost, 
Last December I checked into a psych ward instead of killing myself. Fuck depression. State SGT Forge says currently suicidal person here, lived a kind of shit life. Abusive parents, bobbed through foster care. Mother is a schizophrenic with psychosis. Recently diagnosed with PTSD and severe depression, with a moderate risk of schizophrenia. So the question is, is suicide a better option than taking the gamble of mental illness? Because my mother was a living nightmare. Zavin says I think the biggest problem for me is imposter syndrome. I have a relatively good life and it doesn't feel like I've earned the right to be depressed. As a result I don't acknowledge it or deal with it professionally. Jit says I called my doctor today. Time to get this shit sorted out he should add that this isn't as huge and sudden as it sounds. Been living with this for more than 10 years, and I've been back on medication for a few months now after a full year off them but things like Bardane's suicide, and Scott Hutchison's in particular, which really punched me in the gut, are a reminder that I need to take this more seriously instead of just munching the pills and hoping it'll go away again. Thank you for the supportive messages though. You'd be surprised how much of a difference they sometimes make. Edgar says when I was a teenager I had bad problems with depression and anxiety that led to very self-destructive behavior. There were many times I imagined killing myself and one night I was set on doing it. Came home drunk and sad and started cutting myself, which was one of my methods for dealing with my emotions. I sat in my bed crying, trying to find the courage to cut deeper and end it. Then my dog Snoopy hopped up on the bed and put his head on my lap. Thanks to him I realized that I just couldn't do that to him or to my parents and friends. He saved my life that night. The next day I decided to open up to my parents and ask them to help me find some help, which was a huge step forward. Sometimes all it takes is a reminder that someone loves you to help you start trying to love yourself. Kumpf says this will get buried but until just recently my major depressive disorder was in remission. Something happened about two months ago that turned my life upside down and as a result, I've recently been struggling with suicidal thoughts. They've been escalating, inch by inch I read through maybe 30 responses on this thread and am nearly in tears at my desk. I needed to be reminded that I am not alone and that the metaphorical demon that is depression haunts so many people on this earth. I cannot give up or give in. I needed this today to motivate me to stay the course. I beat this once, I can do it again. One of my favorite quotes is by Winston Churchill, when you're going through hell, keep going thank you to everyone contributing to this thread. Caution Fawan says my mom took her life when I was 12, a year after my parents had separated. Afterwards I lived with my dad and my little sister, and took a big role in raising her while battling my own depression and self-harm 10 years later. Just when I was starting to get in good place emotionally, my sister jumped off a bridge. She was 18 years old. It's been a few years since she took her life. And what I've learned is that no matter how much better you think your family would be without you, that's just not true. I miss my mom. And I miss having a mom. My sister was my best friend. And even after all the tough things she put me through over the years, drug addiction, stealing, etc., it was so worth it to have her around. I think about her every day and would do anything to have her back. Edwin says I don't talk about suicide much, because it is a very painful subject for me. Perhaps, in part, because the shadow of it stalks me sometimes, waiting to catch me when I'm down but 11 years ago, I was desperate enough to believe that everyone who knew me would be better off without me. I believed that the scales weighed heavily against me, that I caused more harm than good, and that if I simply didn't exist, it would make things better for everyone so I started counting my pills. I'd been seeking treatment for depression for 5 months, but nothing was working. The meds made me worse, or they made me so apathetic that I found no joy in life, or they gave me such bad side effects that I could barely stay lucid. I thought there was no way out, so I was counting my pills, trying to figure out how many would cause an overdose so I could take them, lie down in bed, and die I'd arranged them all nicely, counted out every single one. I'd positioned my glass of water next to them all, and I stood staring at the scene, feeling so overwhelmed because the intensity and duration of my suffering had been so drawn out, and it just wasn't getting better. It had been years, years, a slow decline until a breakdown, and then I was in so deep I couldn't see a way out then the phone rang. It was a friend of mine, a Catholic priest, 
who said he felt moved to call me and see how I was doing in case things were bad. I lied to him. I told him that I was fine, that I was receiving treatment and that I was hopeful that things would start looking up, but I didn't think I had any fight left in me. He told me that he believed I did, and that he hoped I could hang on a while longer I hung up the phone and burst into tears. Ugly, inconsolable crying, snot dripping out my nose, curled up in a ball, but my friend had planted a seed of hope. Someone believed in me, even if I couldn't, and I guess I felt that I owed it to him, and to my family, to try I managed to get an appointment at the emergency psychiatry clinic a while later, and there I met the psychiatrist who prescribed the drug that saved my life. I got into a daily outpatient program at the hospital. I met other people who were like me, and I found myself believing in them, believing that they could fight, that they could get better, even though I didn't believe I could. Somehow, they said they believed in me, too. And so for a second time, I saw that other people believed in me, even if I didn't. And I felt again that I should try so I tried. I got into weekly therapy with a psychiatrist, and I was in her care for seven years. She adjusted my meds as needed and we began the long, arduous process of untangling the mess that was my mind. She never gave up on me. I'm in a country where she doesn't make money off me. She gets a flat salary, now, it's 11 years later, and things have gotten better, I am better now than I ever have been, it took a while after my rock bottom moment to find that spark of hope within myself, but I did find it, and that is what kept me going, it made me look for anything I could to keep me hanging on, and even now, it's the small things in life that keep me here, when the moon shines through my window at night and pulls on my pillow. When the white blossoms on that weird bush in the backyard finally bloom for one week every year, and I can smell them on the wind. When my dog wakes up in the morning and comes to get me because he is happy I am awake. When the sun shines just right, or the wind sends petals filtering down through the trees, or the world is silent and glittery after a fresh snowfall I find those moments, and I keep them. I commit them to memory so that when things get bad again, I can remember what I love about this life and remind myself to keep hanging on. I still get low two years ago. I had been fired from my job and was certain I would never become a fully functional adult and I would always have to fight tooth and nail just to exist in society. I stood on a subway platform and listened to the rattle of the trains and tried to convince myself not to jump. The tracks were hypnotizing, almost. I looked up and found myself staring at a poster for suicide prevention, and the irony was not lost on me. It broke the trance. I stepped back from the yellow line and went home. I stayed last month. I got slapped in the face with a bout of severe depression out of nowhere, and then my dog passed away, which made it worse. Dogs immensely improve my mental health, but I stayed you can stay, too. Take it day by day. For those of us with severe mental health issues, that's all we can do. Take it day by day. See how we feel. See if there are any little joys we can find and savor them. You have to cultivate the ability to find them. And it might not be easy at first. I'm a stubborn ass and was originally so intent on believing that there was nothing good in the world that it took me a couple years to learn how to look closer. But eventually, you'll have a breakthrough. Maybe you'll see a toddler get pegged by a ball and you'll fall over laughing. Maybe you'll hear the cicadas buzz in the heat of August and remember how awesome summers felt as a kid. Maybe you'll find an indie game on Steam that has a really compelling story and you'll find that you can't wait to get back to it and find out what happens next. You never know but you can stay. Just take it day by day. And you can see what happens. c 7 says my father hung himself four years ago. And it caught all of our family by total surprise. But in retrospect, the signs were there. I still wish I had seen them more clearly. If I could share a few things I've learned upon reflection, and losing my pops colon Don T be harsh with your loved ones when they're struggling Don T negate sadness or depression, their struggle is real, despite your inability to experience it listen be open, be vulnerable see the clues. My dad never said, I'm hurting, but he did exhibit signs Don T judge Don T try to fix. This is a struggle that can't be fixed by logic by words, by an external force. This person needs to want to change internally, and there's no magic solution like a job, money, or relationship that can do it. All you can do is listen, empathize, 
and love. Be there. Don't hide from the unpleasantness that is depression. Face it with your loved one who struggles. Let them know their pain is your pain, and you are in this together. I miss my dad. For Carachal says damn, this thread is heavy. So much pain from so many different people. For what it's worth, this internet stranger is rooting for you. Liam Mimza says Bourdain's death really bothers me for a specific reason. I think, like many people my age, I struggle with trying to find a vocation that gives me happiness. We're millennials, and we were raised with the idea that we could do whatever we wanted. So when reality hit like a truck, and we found ourselves working the same boring job that 99 and 37 of us were going to get, we found ourselves perpetually unsatisfied with our lives. That's why so many of us struggle with depression. What I hear often is that the true way to happiness is to explore the world, to see culture, to meet people, and to grow that way as a person. That was literally Anthony Bourdain's job. He got paid millions to travel the world, to see culture, to meet people, and to grow. And he killed himself so what hope does that give to the rest of us? Deleted. Says. Deleted. Tidestra says no one knows the burden others carry. Don't trivialize others' pain. It may seem small to you but it is crushing to them. We all have crosses to bear and they are all made of wood. Evans 1006 says I was 12 years old when I found my uncle, who had hanged himself with a belt in my grandma's basement. From that day on, I experienced depression and PTSD and I still do. There's not a day that goes by where I don't think about it. I'm 21 now. Nobody from my family reaches out to me. None of my friends do. I've been alone for the last few years and what I would do for anyone to tell me they care about me and love me. But hey I'm still here. I'm still going. I'm trying. I'm stronger. Deleted. Says I'm now two for two in suicide attempts being stopped by my cat. Just her staring and meowing. Always have something or someone nearby. That might just save you. Fancy Farter says I had some dark episodes in my life where I was severely depressed. Went in and out of psychiatric hospitals. Medication didn't work and I felt so bad that I agreed with electroshocks. It didn't work, I felt like I was out of options. I tried to kill myself, took an overdose and was found two days later, almost dead. I passed out in my chair and had severe pressure ulcers on my lower back and butt cheeks. I was in a coma for two weeks. My kidneys shut down, dialysis was required. I sustained nerve damage due to cut off blood circulation and I had to learn to walk again. Couldn't pee normally. Multiple operations were required to fix the pressure ulcer mess. I hated that I was found before I died. Time passed by and things gradually became better. Aside from nerve pains and a partially paralyzed foot I fully recovered. I found a good job people that supported me in an environment in which I could recover. Bit by bit I crawled out of the dark hole. I came across someone who loved me, she became my wife and we have been happily married for three years. I became a dad and there are times when I'm the happiest guy in the world. I'm so extremely grateful that I made it out of the darkness alive. Sometimes I still feel the dark. But I learned that it always will get better eventually. My best friend, who I met in a psychiatric hospital, didn't find his way to the light. He sunk deeper, couldn't take it anymore and committed suicide. Unfortunately he succeeded. The world turns on but he will be 26 forever. It's extremely confronting to feel how much it hurts when someone you love sinks too deep and leaves this world. For friends and family it's a scar that never heals. If only he had found his place in the world, it would have been different. Whoever you are that reads this, and is sinking so deep that death seems inevitable, try to fight like you never fought before, and don't give up. Do it for the people that love you, but more important, try to do it for your future self. Somewhere there is a place for you to heal. I wholeheartedly hope you will find it. Stay strong and keep going for the light. Shut up and swallow says I've been dealing with depression for years now but I did try to commit suicide in high school. I hit rock bottom when a family member falsely accused me of raping them. The police, 
my family, everyone in my life seemed to take their side. The judge ruled that I couldn't stay at my house during the investigation because my little sisters were there and they seemed me a danger to them. I ended up being put up in a shitty hotel for a month while my attorney fought to have any kind of medical exam done to try to prove my innocence. Being shunned by everyone I've cared for got to be too much and I decided I'd had enough. I managed to get a hold of a bunch of pain pills and a fifth of Jack and took them all and went to bed. I woke up the next morning in a pool of vomit. In the end though, I'm glad I survived my attempt. Things got better. My accuser couldn't keep their story straight and ended up confessing to making it up in court. My life has started to stabilize and I met the woman of my dreams who has helped me work through my issues. I still deal with depression but I've got a pretty good treatment regimen right now. Sorry if this seems rambling. This is the first time I've ever mentioned this in any kind of public setting. Deleted. Says I've had two attempts in the last two years. My life right now is actually going pretty well. It just sucks that all these people keep killing themselves. It makes me worried about my future. Am I going to hold on until I'm 35 then put a bullet through my head? Am I going to drown myself at 42? I've been struggling with wanting to die for 15 years. I'm medicated. I completed a program recently. I don't know man maybe it's not worth it. I have a good partner right now and a good support system though. I was honest with my girlfriend this morning about how this has all made me feel we're getting pizza and driving into the mountains or maybe the forest tonight to reconnect with nature. I tend to find peace after that today's rough edit. The thing that got me recently was talking to my roommate best friend about my mental health the last couple years she's usually stoic we work for the same company and she's known as the Scrooge. With a secret soft heart. She looked at me and said, the thing is, if you had been successful, I know that 10 years from now, I'd be sitting in like a Denny's or something sitting across from other friend, and I'd be smiling, but then, I'd still look at an empty chair and wonder if you'd be there with me and she cried so deeply, I'm tearing up now just thinking about it gah. T-H-R-O-W-A-W-A-Y-J-K-L-O-L-1323 says I tried to kill myself at the end of May of this year. I felt like I hit rock bottom, and at the time it seemed like the only way out. I lost the woman I loved, I started drinking every day, I hurt a lot of people emotionally. I thought that if I pushed everyone away, it would be easier to let go. I'm not comfortable saying how I did it, but when I regained consciousness I called a friend who helped me. I'm so glad that I wasn't successful. When I was a young child, my mom and I walked in on my brother unconscious after a hanging and it's an image that is seared into my brain. Thankfully he survived, but I'll never forget my mom's screams of agony, and her pleading with God when she was trying to get him to wake up. The thought of her having to go through that again, ensures that I will never attempt it anymore. Instead of wishing to die in my sleep, I'm so thankful for every day that I wake up. Because every day, is a fresh start dot into the kind stranger on here who has talked to me and helped me, if you ever read this, thank you so much, you have helped more than you'll ever know. Rubbish account 88 says please be mindful that most suicidal people are well aware of the existence of suicide hotlines, that many of them are also well versed in the kinds of pith advice people want to dish out so liberally, well intentioned as it is, and that many of them do not want to die. They just do not know what else to do. Some are truly devastatingly depressed or mentally ill. But this is not uniformly true. Many many people who are suicidal are genuinely not mentally ill. Speaking of myself a long time ago now and others I have known, there are people out there whose suicidal ideation is a logical analytic response to essentially impossible life pressures and situations and, right or wrong, it can feel very hurtful, even offensive, and unhelpful to tell them their thinking is clouded. I and others I have known used the same basically functional working, but very very stressed, analytic mind to choose not to commit suicide. As I moved through that place and eventually out of it, I had to hold on to the option in my mind and make the choice albeit increasingly more easily many times before it was gone. All that and this too, please don't turn people into messages or sars. Suicide is absolutely horrible, I have been affected by its aftermath more times than I care to share very directly and less intimately as well. 
it is probably almost never the right thing to do, save terminal illness, etc., but it's important to honor lives as more than their ending. Rambunctious Mango says I never bothered planning for the rest of my life because I didn't expect to make it through high school. I graduated last week and I'm off to college in a few months. Still can't really imagine staying alive, but I'm not actively trying to end it. So I guess that's good. 3 Ico says my brother committed suicide at the age of 15. I was 16 at the time. One piece of advice that I can give to those who have been affected by suicide is to talk to someone, I mean talk to someone, whether it be a friend, parent or hell even your dog, just talk. I'm almost 26 now and for years and directly after, I buried all of my emotions and refused to talk to anyone, even my family, about it. It has really messed me up both emotionally and with my relationship with people in the world in the long run, and only in the last year have I realized this. So, please, just talk to someone, don't be like me. Cree says on Friday I got tired of being tired. It was weird. As soon as I reviewed my plans and checked it would work I felt calm and relieved. I started working on my letters to family. My husband had some friends over already. Everyone was drinking and hanging out. I left the notebook unattended and my 17-year-old steps and saw it, and asked to talk, for the first time in my eight years of being his stepmom, him, his girlfriend, and my other steps and had me sit and talk for hours. They told me all the things in my head weren't real. For eight years all I had was good and bad memories and no way to tell which ones they remember. For a lot of reasons I thought they barely tolerated me. I never thought they would care if I left if you love someone, tell them you do, tell them often, it could save a life. Deleted, says I was suicidal about six months ago after my girlfriend lifelong best friend left me, I decided I finally needed help, I knew I had deep issues but didn't want to deal with them, I always masked them and found ways to distract myself I went to my family doctor and got referred to a psychiatrist and I've been seeing a few for the last couple months I feel very proud to say that this week has been my first week in years that I can say I've been genuinely happy and proud of myself it gets better it genuinely does even when you're in the deepest hole but you can't do it alone you can't just cover over your issues you need to destroy them in Canada you can get referred to therapists for free by your family doctor it takes a long time, but the wait is worth it. In the meantime, tell your friends. If they're your true friends, they'll understand. And, if you're like me, you'll find out that they're going through the same thing at it. Wow, didn't expect such a huge response. I didn't even expect anybody to see this. Thank you everybody for the kind words. Unfortunately, not everything works for everybody. I also have no idea how things work in the US. If somebody has gotten help in the States. Please respond to a few comments below edit too. Thanks for the gold. Also, it appears that some places in Canada you do not get free therapists. Hopefully it'll be easier for everybody one day. Relieved face. Kidney Kidney says a guy I didn't like committed suicide. We'll call him Harry. He was a very close friend of my boyfriend's and they had big dreams about their future together as best friends. However, myself and Harry would always end up clashing. We were younger then, a lot of thinking things were more important than they were. He was also seeing a very close friend of mine and that relationship was turbulent as well. Battle lines were drawn and then they went and then they were. We were young. I can't tell you how important it all felt at the time and now it feels so insignificant. Harry and I were civil a lot of the time, occasionally we weren't. We both tried hard for the sake of my boyfriend and his girlfriend my friend to get along, and I'm happy in retrospect that we were. There were times when he and I would meet to start again and try and become friends, have a coffee, chat, but it didn't ever last before he died I invited him to come round and play board games in a few weekends with my boyfriend and I he replied a few days later saying he wasn't feeling well but that he would come. I talked to him about cold sores, we both got them, and then that was it. The following Saturday they found him. My boyfriend was inconsolable and it was so sunny outside and I couldn't understand. He phoned his friends and he said it's not good news and from his end of the phone call he kept saying through tears I'm not joking, because that's all the receiver could believe, it had to be a sick joke. I felt incredibly uncomfortable around Harry's family, I felt an imposter for grieving when our grievances were well known, I was livid that he did this, and I felt desolate that this happened, and I felt responsible that I didn't pick up on his message, 
I later learned I was the only person he messaged that week. Closer friends would interrogate me and ask did I suspect anything? What did the message say? What did I say back? I felt ashamed that it never occurred to me, and I was desperately apologetic to people who asked for the comfort that I couldn't give friends drove from all over to go see his family. People we'd not seen since college but still had incredibly strong friendships with, and we all sat against the wall of Harry's mom's garden and smoked. We laughed a lot too, in the sunshine. Funny stories and then someone would sob and my heart would break. I was so sorry the nights were worse. My boyfriend was spiraling. He couldn't sleep and when he did he would jolt awake and remember and be miserable. He would cry and look at photos of the two of them and nobody went to counseling. I should have insisted. Everyone should have gone. He went eventually. As far as I know all the men went eventually. The people who went earlier fared better than the ones who waited Harry's brothers told them if anyone felt that way they should say something, speak to someone. They all nodded. I started having dreams of Harry in awful situations. The nature in which he died bled into my nights and I would see him in all these different ways and I would be tortured. The hardest was when I dreamt he had to go and see his family, but he stopped by me first. I knew that I had to tell him to talk to someone, but as is the nature of dreams, I knew if I told him he would go and he wouldn't get to see his family again. I woke up sorry and responsible again I thought about Harry every day for the first two years. Every single day. It scared me that life moved on. But it didn't really because we still spoke about it in coffee shops and at the beach. We were just older. I thought of my own mortality a lot. I was terrified that my boyfriend would do the same thing. Every time my boyfriend went to the store I would count minutes until I was in a panic, terrified he wasn't coming back, but too afraid to tell him, in case I would plant a seed in his head. Irrational, but everything that had happened was not how it should have been when he would get drunk my boyfriend would become very melancholy. There was a time by a harbor when I was out of the country and I phoned his mom. It took a long time for him to get help, and that happened when I said, after years, that I didn't know if I could do this, the fear was suffocating and his sadness was hurting me. I sound selfish, but it hurt. I would dread opening the door after work in case inside was something I didn't want to see. I started to think of Harry less in a sad way as the years went on, but not completely happy either. I can't tell you how much he used to aggravate me. I still feel the red-hot anger of delayed adolescence when he would deliberately provoke me. I still feel the anchor sit in the sandy pit of my stomach when I remember the day he died, my world spinning in a wild orbit, and how it was so sunny and we saw a friend and drank coffee in his garden and sobbed I still remember how I choked at the funeral. It was the blackest sadness I've ever felt and I didn't even like him if I could see him I would beg him to get help, I'd refuse to let him out of my sight until he was safe. I would tell him that things would be okay even though he really didn't feel like it, and more than anything I would ask him how he was doing. I would listen to him and I would do anything, anything I could to prevent it I didn't like him and I am still so desperately sorry about his death I didn't even like him and I absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt would prefer him here to annoy the shit out of me, every day, relentlessly, I didn't even like him and my life has felt it's been in vignette since he died, a little out of focus at the periphery, a little black around the edges please seek help, it will affect so many more people than you know. Birdman 133 says in 2015 I was fresh off a wonderful honeymoon with my amazing wife when I hit a little low. I'm manic depressive and am used to the ups and downs, but this low didn't go away. I thought I was stronger than my depression but it just kept going. After about six months my spouse was just barely able to hang in there and was spending a lot of time at her mother's in another town because I was just such a fucking asshole and was losing myself. Christmas night that year, wife was at her family's celebration, I sat in our guest bedroom alone and had my 9mm in my hand. I struggled and was crying and angry and a fucking nightmare was unfolding in my head. I couldn't do it though. I let my dog in and be jumped on me and was licking me and wagging his tail, so I hung out with him for a while and put the gun away. I promised my wife I would try to make the changes necessary to recover and fast forward to today, we're halfway through her pregnancy with our first. It's a boy. I'm very physically active and I have things to work towards and now a son coming that deserves a great set of parents. My wife is incredible and she stuck with me through times where I would have left myself, 
She did what she could when she could, considering how much I was pushing everyone away during that time. I can never repay her for being loyal to me when I don't think I deserved loyalty. I just hope I can give her and my son the best husband and dad possible for the rest of our lives. Edit. At the time, I was planning to make everyone hate me so no one would miss me when I finally killed myself. It was the dark pattern that made me lose who I was. I am a different person today and I have learned to recognize the signs and not ignore my small lows. I never miss a chance to tell my wife how wonderful she is. I also added the physically active part because getting back into shape and being physically tired is incredibly therapeutic for me, personally. General Winky says lately my depression's been really bad. It seems like no matter how much I try to reach out no one gives a fuck about your mental health until you're already dead. The amazing Nick says a guy is walking down the street and falls down a hole. The walls are so steep he can't climb out. A doctor passes by and the guy says L, hey can you help me out? The doctor writes him a prescription, throws it in the hole, and moves on. Then a priest walks by again the man shouts, Father can you help me out? The priest writes a prayer, throws it in the hole, and moves on. A friend walks by later the man shouts, Hey Joe it's me can you help me out? So the friend jumps down into the hole and our guy says, What are you stupid now? We're both down here and the friend says, Yay but I've been down here before and I know the way out you are never alone. Man Joe Fazla says my best friend killed himself about 11 years ago at the age of 25. And I will never forget when he called me the last time. We talked casually. At the end of the conversation he dropped a question on how I dealt with my anxiety attacks as he was experiencing a similar situation. At this point in his life he was just about to finish his degree in industrial design. He had a girlfriend from Spain and life in general looked promising. However I guess he felt anxiety about his girlfriend leaving back for her home country. Him ending one life segment and entering a new one. He jumped to his balcony located on the 8th floor. I remember getting the call where I was told that he was gone. I had to lean over as I felt all my air was sucked out of my lungs. Surreal. I remember cleaning out his apartments with other friends to help his parents. Driving his car back to his parents from the college town he lived I and I, I remember us meeting in 1989 in first grade, where we became friends I, I remember being at his funeral that Tom was his name. And I remember you forever. Sashrin says hi, I tried to commit suicide last week everything was going down the drain I wasn't participating in school, I was distancing myself from my friends. My mom had been confined in the hospital around eight times this year alone. And my boyfriend of eight years said that he didn't love me the same anymore. Wednesday last week was supposed to be my last day. I started taking hella pills in the morning, but I still went to school. I distanced myself from my group of friends. Saying that I had a migraine, I had already said my goodbyes to them in my mind. I went to see my mom in the hospital afterwards. I was mentally apologizing to her about what I was about to do. Then she sat me down and talked to me about how she was feeling she told me that she was thankful that I was always there for her, small things like how I stayed with her the whole day during Mother's Day. Even though she knew that I was bored out of my mind she told me that she was so thankful that I was around to help take care of my siblings she told me that I was one of the pillars of her strength, and that she would always love me. No matter what she told me that she didn't know what she would do without me, and that my faith in her is what gives her strength every day when I came home that night. I had prepared all the things that I needed, all the notes were there, and of course, all the pills however, I couldn't bring myself to start whenever I tried to start. I thought about my mom and how she said that my support for her lessened half her battle I thought about my sisters what if my mom gives up fighting when I'm gone my sisters will be left without a mother, and a sister I would be known as the sister who committed suicide before she even turned 21 who would be there to guide them, and to teach them I might be living for someone else right now but I want to live for the sake of my mom and my sisters, I'll fight just for a little while longer. Thugly says I got a dog here. If I didn't come home one day, he'd never stop sitting by the door waiting for me. He'd never stop missing my smell and my voice. He'd never stop wishing for one more walk, 
one more game of chasing the laser with me, one more high five for a treat. He'd never stop jumping to peek out the window when he heard somebody coming up the sidewalk, and letting his heart be filled with a moment's joyful hope. No matter how many times that hope was dashed, he'd never let go of it. He's kind of a doofus that way that anybody else in my life might eventually get over it. You can explain to them what happened and they'd at least be able to understand if not accept it. But my little brown dog would sit forever wondering why I didn't come home. And he's had a hard enough life so far. I was his only friend when he had nobody, and he was mine. And no matter what I'm going through in life, putting him through that sort of suffering is not something my soul would ever let me do. Otherwise, I probably would have done it already. Life is random. There's no fate. There's no karma. This secret doesn't actually work, except for making the people who wrote those books rich. There's no magic Santa Claus in the sky making sure all the good people are blessed and the bad people are punished. Maybe God exists, but he sure doesn't interfere. I've been praying for decades for some sort of help, or at least guidance so I can help myself. No response. No answers either. For example, why did a loving God let such an abusive monster come into my mom's life when I was a kid, turning me into an emotional cripple who can't deal with any sort of stress without grumbling? Why does child abuse happen every single day in this world? No response. So a sane person can only conclude that it's all just random. That can be scary. But it can also be liberating. It means that the sheer law of averages will save your ass at some point. It can't all be bad forever. That breaks the laws of the universe. At some point something randomly good will happen. The scales will eventually balance. There's no intelligence behind it. It's just chaos that's part good and part bad. Accept it. Fighting it won't change anything. One thing's for sure, though, those who are prepared for the random things that come their way will have a better time dealing with them. Sit exactly on the middle line between optimism and pessimism. Prepare for emergencies so that they don't destroy you, and enjoy the good things to the fullest when they do come. But overall, just wait and watch. Knowing and accepting that nothing can be good forever, but neither can anything be bad forever. Crystal says people try to reach out and say I'll help you, I'll talk to you, if you need me, but it's not enough. If you had a massive issue that you couldn't even pinpoint what it was, how would you go about telling someone about it, and asking for help? Or even when you do tell them you are having issues, and they shrug it off because they aren't in your place and they can't understand. What do you do? Nothing. You're alone I was depressed for a little over a year, and that year felt like an eternity. I felt like a prisoner in my own mind. Depression feels like, being stuck in a dark, cramped, windowless room. You can't see anything, you can't move, you're suffocating, you're panicking. There are people on the outside telling you that they will figure out a way to get you out, that they are with you, but in truth they have no idea what to do and you're not even sure if they are trying, or if they even care. People who care will actually do something about it. They will drag you out of bed, kicking and screaming to get you to a hospital, or a mental institute, or a appointment with a therapist, or psychologist. And the only reason I ever got better was because someone physically forced me to leave my house and see a doctor. And even after being denied and confused about where to find help, he spent the entire day with me, driving around town to different hospital locations to find me a psychologist because that's what good friends fucking do. So stop telling people that you are there just to talk, and instead actually take action to help them. People who have depression are so enclosed within their room that they can't reach out to people, and that is why people are dying from suicide. My two friends who both died at such an early age to depression, they were two of the most beautiful, kind, popular, and loving people I have ever met, and I always feel so fucking heartbroken that I didn't know what to do until it was too late. Skiredman Hello says I tried to kill myself 15 years ago due to chronic shooting pain in my head that no one could diagnose. Luckily I failed and eventually they went away on their own. I have a good life and a great family right now. My son was recently diagnosed with chronic headaches and I've never been more terrified that once he gets tired of living in pain he's going to follow in my footsteps. He is in therapy but I am just so scared. 
Retro RN says this comment will get buried, but my brother killed himself on his 24th birthday. He never left a note, and always seemed so happy. He had a ton of friends and I'll never really have an answer or closure. Not knowing why has always been the hardest part. I got treated like shit by family and friends after he died. Everyone treated me like I had some sort of contagious disease every time a public figure dies by suicide, I always feel sick to my stomach. In the US, the mentally ill are disproportionately ignored and stigmatized. I really wish nobody ever had to go through a loss like this. Suicide is 100% preventable, yet nobody cares. Jen Duel says when I was 19 I got into a silly immature argument with my ex over a white lie. Turns out that was the tip of the iceberg and she took her own life. Oh and top of that I've been back and forth to the doctors myself UK for 12 years now and finally been diagnosed with BPD on top of depression and anxiety. I have no goals or aspirations, struggling to grasp onto the last of the enjoyment in my interests if any and I'm really at the peak of what I can cope with. I constantly use dark humor to shadow over how I really feel. Been through 12 jobs in the last year, some of which I didn't go back after the first day. To the point where I idolize the toxic live streaming environment, but like most things give up before I've even really tried. I kind of hate when someone famous dies because everyone jumps on the bandwagon of being supportive for a week and it all disappears and no one ever thinks to reach out to people struggling but will happily share a post. I'm not talking about myself either I'm talking about those worse off than me. TLDR depressed ramble at it. If anyone for whatever reason wants to know more details on anything, I'm more than happy to share the fine details I just originally replied from my phone. Chikot5590 says all of my life my dad would attempt suicide. I couldn't even give a rough guess how many times one of my earliest memories was finding my mom crying in her bedroom holding a noose that she had found in the loft. I didn't understand at the time. It took me a long time to realize that, actually. It's not normal for a parent to drink themselves into oblivion and take a handful of drugs or slit their wrists. He was later diagnosed with bipolar. Fast forward when I was a teenager my parents had split up. Dad was steeply declining in his mental health. Still drinking heavily. Still attempting threatening suicide almost weekly he would attempt to run into walls with knives against his stomach until I'd grab him. Constantly overdose. Cut himself my mom then remarried. I always felt a responsibility to keep my dad happy and safe so left my mom's wedding early to meet my dad to make sure he was holding up okay. Of course we met in the pub, still in my bridesmaid dress. My dad walked over to me very wobbly. I assumed he was drunk. He flopped his arm around me and told me he was going to get another drink as he walked away my dress was completely covered in blood across my waist. He had slid his wrist in a zigzag from inner elbow to his hand I told the barman what had happened. Walked out the door burst into tears and ran two miles home at this stage I had completely had enough. I remember vividly thinking I just wish he would get it over and done with so I don't have to deal with it. But still I went up every day to make sure he was eating, taking his meds and generally keeping him company. At 15 I hadn't been up in around a week. My best friend and I had planned a girls night around our mutual friend's house and popped in to see my dad on the way over. As soon as I walked into the communal corridor I smelled it. I knew. Found him led on his living room floor, flat on his back with his eyes open, flies crawling on his arms, called for an ambulance, silly, I know, I was 15 and thought they could save him, I don't think anyone realizes the physical pain of being told I'm sorry he's been gone for some time, there's nothing we can do, until they go through it, it feels like a knife to the chest, the aftermath of so many I didn't think he would ever actually do it was astounding. Please, if ever somebody tells you somebody self-harms for attention, take them damn seriously. There are only so many cries of help people can give. Freeze in me Sammy says I'm scared. I'm scared for my future because I struggle with depression and wonder what my place in life is. If talented singers, chefs, designers and successful people choose to end their life. What is my fate? Minimize to one item says people who are suicidal feel like they can't talk about it with anyone because they will be committed, drugged and stigmatized. We need to have a better outlet for suicide to be discussed without judgment or immediate hospitalization because that is not always the answer. Deleted. Says. Deleted. 
Lunarkatan says a few years ago my dad attempted suicide. He and my mom had divorced, and he wasn't coping well, drinking a lot, punching holes in the walls, though never any violence beyond that. He messaged me one night while I was getting McDonald's with my then boyfriend. I distinctly remember the fries being perfectly hot and salty for some reason. His message said, I love you, for about 20 lines on my phone. I panicked and said we needed to go home. When I arrived, my grandfather was there, along with the police and an ambulance. I was 100% sure he had died. No one would let me into the house or let me see what had happened. Moments later, a few police officers walked him out of the house, helping to carry him since he was so drunk. He was taken to the hospital when he called me the next morning, he said. I can't tell you how happy I was to wake up today. I'm so glad I failed. Medusta says I've attempted suicide three times in my life. The first I was attempting to slit my wrists and I was stopped by my childhood friend. The second I had a gun in mouth and I heard my nephew laugh from across the house and I couldn't have him see that. The third I had accrued a gun. Picked my location to go out to in a field. Went to close all of my bank accounts to leave my money for my family. My sister found my note. Told my dad, who is a cop, and his fellow officers picked me up at work and I was hospitalized. Mental illness needs to be addressed. As someone that suffers from it, I know how hard it is to talk about let alone live with. I spent years being silent about my illness. I was ashamed. I thought it was my fault and I should be able to handle it. I was wrong. It cost me jobs, friends, and partners. It very nearly cost me my life. Once I was hospitalized I was finally able to receive the help I desperately needed. I'm still rebuilding. I still struggle. But I can now see a light at the end of the tunnel. To everyone that suffers from mental illness, I see you, I'm here for you, and you are not alone. The world may seem empty, everything may lose its luster, just know that there are those who genuinely care for and support you, even if you can't always see or feel it. Where the rice life says my brother killed himself in 2010. No one saw it coming. This is someone who had a very bright future ahead of him. He was all set to take over the family business. He was a quarterback in high school and also rode dirt bikes, and he was really good at both. He loved to fish and hunt, he was passionate about a lot of things in life, especially his two-year-old daughter. He had a beautiful and infectious smile. Anyway, he caught his girlfriend cheating on him one night, and apparently she was sending him pictures of her with the guy. He was heartbroken. They had a baby together, and lived together. I remember him telling me all he wanted was his family back. She moved out and shortly after he saw her at a bar with her new boyfriend, the bar where both my stepsister and stepbrother worked and one that she knew my brother frequented. Why she chose to go to that bar with him is beyond me. My brother got shit-faced and showed up at her new apartment. He pointed the gun at her new boyfriend and when his ex got on the phone with the police, he turned it on himself. I remember vividly going over there two day after to pick up my niece, and the bloodstain was still there in the breezeway. My dad got a knock on his door at 3 a.m., it was two state troopers telling him his only son was gone. I remember the phone call, my sister telling me he shot himself, and it didn't even fully register. All I could do was mother, is he alive? I remember sitting around my kitchen table with my family, all of us just quietly crying. My dad almost sold his boat because they would fish together, and it was too painful to take it out anymore. I'm happy to say that eight years later my dad just went to Lake Erie, by himself, and he said he felt like my brother was on the lake with him. It almost gets harder as time goes on because you start to remember less and less about them and the memories are all you have. My niece is the spitting image of him, having her around is like having a piece of him with us, she's very special to us. What his suicide did to me personally is a whole different story. He was my best friend, and after he died I went down a very dark path. I self-medicated and became addicted. At one point the only thing that was keeping me from hanging myself from a pipe in my basement was that I couldn't imagine putting my dad through the pain of losing another child. 
The following five years after his death I put my family through hell all over again. I was still alive but actively trying to kill myself with drugs. I have been sober for four years, have a beautiful son now, and I am set to graduate college this December. Life is pretty good. We miss him every day and the pain of losing him will never go away, but where there is life, there is hope. There is never someone who is too far gone or that can turn things around, I am proof. The only reason I'm still here is because I finally surrendered, and got the help I needed. I wish my brother had done the same. None of us had any idea what he was going through mentally. If you suspect someone is struggling, reach out to them. I'm sorry to everyone who lost someone to suicide, I know your pain, and to those fighting the good fight, keep pushing, close fist. Fuck this, Iwantiski says please don't use the saying it's a permanent solution to a temerapy problem that this might be true for someone who suffers from situational depression. The depression that goes away that for someone with chronic depression it never truly goes away. It is not a temporary problem. It can be managed. You can be better. You can learn to live almost normally. But when a person has been suffering for years, barely living, barely able to get out of bed most morning, it's not a temporary problem that when I was in my worst depressed state and I heard that saying for the first time, what I heard was, it's a permanent solution to a permanent problem and you know what? That was comforting. It was encouraging in the wrong way. I wanted to just cease to exist. Not have to worry about waking up the next morning. What got me through was knowing that I would destroy my children's lives. I knew they would blame themselves. Even if I thought they were better off without me there and that I was damaging them. If I took my life it would be much worse for them that I started therapy. And that was the hardest thing I have ever done. Just finding a therapist was way harder than it should have been. I decided to show my kids that even though I was damaged and broken I could be strong that I started being selfish in a good way. I started taking care of myself. If I couldn't get out of bed one day I didn't. I only did the bare minimum of what needed to be done. I dropped the kids off at school and came home and slept or just watched TV. I picked up the kids from school and ordered pizza that but I only gave myself one day. My therapist called it my isolation day. The next morning I got up. I set goals for myself. One a week. Something simple. When I accomplished that goal I celebrated. Then set a new one for the next week. My first goal was just going to the hardware store and picking out the paint for a furniture refab I wanted to do. When I say my therapist next I showed her a picture of my finished project. She was so proud of me she hugged me that IT apostrophe has been a long hard journey and it will never end but I have learned to find joy in my life. I will never be cured and I will always have bad episodes but that's okay. I know they will end and I can get back to living that there's an organization called always keep fighting I've chosen to live by those words. When things are bad I take a sharpie eye and under my watch band write the letters AKF. I can just look at it remember that I am strong and I can get through this. Public enemy number zero says my mom was about to commit suicide after getting diagnosed with depression and nothing seemed to help. Before she could go through with it, she walked by the room my sister and I showed and saw us laughing. We were watching Inside Out, I remember, and she realized how we'll be crying instead of laughing if she goes through with it. So she didn't do it. She hit a rough patch. But she tried ketamine and it really seemed to work for her. She's doing a lot better now. Antonimbus says yesterday I was drying off in the shower when my wife came home. So I stayed quiet and hid. I heard her go from room to room looking and calling for me for several minutes. Even going outside twice. Before finally finding me in the bathroom. I asked where you worried something happened to me and she said I was afraid I would find you hanging from the ceiling in the garage. I still don't really think I have a problem. Everyone gets down sometimes, but if someone that close to me is legitimately worried about me, I guess I should probably be worried about me too. 
L-I-N-H-A-R-T-R-T-R-T-O says suicide has touched my life in so many sad ways. My younger brother was the awkward fat kid. As an adult, he struggled to find his footing. He wanted desperately to find a technology job, but the breaks that I stumbled upon somehow avoided him. A few years past his 30th birthday, he burned down the cabin he rented from our mom with himself inside. I'm tearing up right now thinking of all the cool stuff he missed out on. He would have loved it. We never got to play WoW together or fly quadcopters. I miss you, Rick. Thirabud says, man, this is not a good thread to read through if you're struggling with suicidal ideation. The temptation of suicide is ever present once it's blossomed, I think. The idea abates but lingers, biding its time. You can still have so many things to be happy for, so many things to be Pollyanna glad about, and still, the sticky sweet sing song of, but you could be done, you could be over it and not struggling anymore, you could rest chirps persistently in your ear. Many times friends say, come, talk to me when you feel this way. Therapists ask you to be open with them, are you feeling suicidal right now? At first, you want to trust them, but, almost always, with friends, you end up having to reassure them that you aren't going to actually go through with it. The emotional toll of reassuring someone else when you are already feeling drained and fragile is a lodestone around the neck, cement shoes on a river during the first freeze. And therapists, bless their hearts, and I do mean that in the very southernest way I can manage, tend to react and report you rather than listening. Say you end up in the hospital because you chose to check yourself in instead of follow through with your plan. You may also, as low income, end up in a facility with heavy drug users and addicts and other lost little puppies such as yourself, and you'll get so heavily medicated you walk around in an apathetic fog, still struggling to breath in enough air to not die in a way that feels more like murder. Group therapy will become the bane of your existence. Here, rip open your wounds in the company of strangers. You're safe here a perky fresh out of college or drained dead around the eyes doctor will say. Nurses chat cheerily with patients. Oh, you'll be back. They always are. So you withdraw more. You tuck away the horror you feel at the prospect of trudging through more struggles, bill roulette and day after day, week after week, of trudging through the motions at work. You hide your loneliness, which at times threatens to overwhelm you with a black tidal wave of nothingness, under a veneer of cheerfulness and compassion and empathy. You learn to make your smile reach your eyes and body language when you want to weep for how much you long to be able to hold out your arms to someone anyone, and say, help me, I just want to belong, to fit in, to have a place that feels like the home I've read of in the stories, but you can't, and so you go about your day smiling but still hearing the quiet weeping of a small child tucked into a corner in the back room of your mind, and sometimes the weeping abates, and sometimes the beauty and joy around you slip in, like glorious little snapshots in a world full of dark grey, and you feel content, warm, even, happiness, and then, not right away, but eventually the crying of the small child is audible again, and you have to play the game of, reasons, what reasons do I have to stay, what reasons do I have that prevent me from leaving, you yeah. air, suicide can be seen as selfish, you like to think you own a piece of those who you love just as you give pieces of yourself to them to cherish as well, but sometimes, sometimes, on the days and nights when the weeping is the loudest, an inky black ocean of sorrow lapping at your feet as the tide threatens to come up and fully overwhelm you at last, as the storm clouds in your mind darken, and the apathy threatens to steal your very last sliver of breath from your very lips, then yes, I can understand, much better than I ever wished to, why the siren song of suicide could overcome a person, no matter how hard they try to fight it, and hopefully, hopefully, if you didn't before, you can now too. Brick says I attempted suicide by overdose when I was a junior in high school. I'm about 22 now, so it's been 6 years. I took in the whole 100 count bottle of acetaminophen and I said some off things, my goodbyes, to my friends and they noticed and rushed over at midnight to tell my parents something was very wrong and call the ambulance. I wouldn't fess up to what I did but they knew from my eyes that I wasn't okay either so they took me to the hospital and made me ingest the absolutely horrifying liquid charcoal. I threw it up all over myself in the middle of the night but when I woke up at one point I saw my mom turned over praying and crying and I'll never forget it. The other sight that stops me from it all now is my dad crying when they checked me into the ward.
In all of my life I had never seen him cry except for that one day. People out there love you. Even if you don't have family that supports you, friends are there. Around two years after that I got pet bunnies and I love them to death. I can't imagine leaving my pets behind and when I get emotionally distressed I go over and pet them in silence and it helps me calm down a little more and straighten myself out. It's hard, but it's something. Therapy helped me and my family open up to each other about things that I kept and that caused me to go over the edge. Now, especially being someone who knows firsthand what that dark void feels like I push to help my friends around me if I feel like they're going through the same thing. Wants to know your story says my mother burned herself when I was 10. We were in a city in West India far away from our hometown in the south. My parents were having troubles in their marriage and my dad would head over to the factory and work 12 hour shifts. I remember her crying a lot and feeling alone. I remember her striking a matchstick and pouring kerosene over her body. I remember crying and asking her to stop and then trying to fill a bucket of water in vain hoping to douse the flames that would soon engulf the apartment. I managed to get out of the house and I took my little sister with me. The man living below our house came up to see what the commotion was all about and he made me promise to only tell the police that it was just an accident so that my dad wouldn't be investigated or kept in jail for a long while. Dad and my grandmother practically brought me up and I resented my dad and my sister for a long time. Even as we moved countries and my life improved materially, I would frequently break into fights with my dad and I barely interacted with my stepmom dad I don't blame my mother. I blame society for not allowing women to divorce men in the 90s. I have learned to forgive my dad but I still can't be in the same place as him dad I have grappled with depression for many years and I struggle to form friendships and I hate it when I lose people. Breakups are especially hard. I have endless empathy for most people and I do a better job making other people happy than I do myself but I live out my days wondering why I am alive and secretly wishing I was dead. My recent bout of depression has less to do with my childhood and more to do with recent events but I feel it helped create a very weak mental constitution. I'm a journalist and a poet and I talk about suicide and depression often and I am a living example of how tortured loved ones become after they lose people to suicide. My only request for the world be that if someone is upset then talk to them daily and guide them towards therapy. Depression is an incredibly lonely illness and people are part of the cure. Here's a poem I wrote called You Don't Look Depressed. HTTPS colon slash slash twitter dot com slash s u h a s r b h a t slash status slash nine three two six five six seven eight nine eight eight seven three one one eight seven eight question s equals one nine deleted says deleted Javalicious Gene says I was suicidal for years. I'm now on medication and am much more stable emotionally. The itch to end my life hasn't gone away, but it's now an impulse that I can control, logic my way out of, and distract myself from. I see so many posts after tragedies like these, saying things like talk to me if you need help, and those are good, but, it's not enough. Seek out people in your life who are depressed or seem off, listen to them, empathize with them, don't treat their feelings as trivial, regardless of what you think of their life. Have unconditional positive regard for every human being you encounter. Not everyone who is depressed or suicidal will reach out. For some, it's too hard or they don't want to bother people or they don't think they're worth it. That's where we, the stable people in their lives need to do better. It's not our responsibility to save them, or even make them feel loved. It's our job to listen and do the best we can to be a good human being. Nikki Nikki Bobicki says I've been suicidal for years. Chronic depression and bipolar will do that. My young children keep me alive. Drakabix says I've been struggling with depression and bipolar all my life. It's getting worse now that I'm older. I broke down to my girlfriend about a month ago, bowling. Admitted I was tired of life in general and that I just don't have faith in myself as a person. I feel bland and boring and my social anxiety just always makes it worse in social situations. That brings me to this. I'm out of town this weekend to hang out with my girlfriend's friends and I don't know them too well. 
I really need help coping and trying to enjoy myself. I'm worried if I don't enjoy myself and let my anxiety get the best of me, I'll spiral even worse when I get back home. From any adjusted person any help? Itchavoid says my best friend killed herself in 2009 by walking into the Baltic Sea one morning in midwinter. It is nearly 10 years but I think of her every day and how I didn't do enough to save her. It is cliche to say but she was too sweet for this world. Too sensitive and too childlike. I am often very angry at her for leaving for me but sometimes I feel jealous she had the balls to do it. As I struggle with my own feelings of suicide. PM me lots of cats says I've attempted three times and the first few days afterwards are always surreal. This last time I drove out to my favorite secluded hiking trail and sat in the snow and cried. I cried because I was so full of hope and happiness as a kid and I was angry at myself for letting that child down. On the way back to town I bought groceries for the next week as a way of promising myself to live mental illness is fucking nasty but I've never once regretted my decision to keep going. There's still a chance I'll make the child in me proud and that's what I hold on to when times get tough. Hurstchifter7 says how can non-suicidal people understand severe depression better so we can look for signs and help our friends and family? Neon Darkly says I think one of the biggest issues leading to this uptick is how incredibly isolated we all are these days. There is no sense of community anywhere. A lot of us are renters so we never develop a sense of community where we live. We're always job hopping so there is no sense of community there. American society is one of hyper-individuality, and people just didn't evolve to function like that. Yeah. We're all in debt up to our eyeballs, we all work crazy work hours for well under what we're worth, we're constantly bombarded by 24-7 media stimuli, but at least people in the past had their community to rely on when life went to shit and I know the intentions are the best, but posting numbers to a suicide hotline and saying, go find someone to talk to are kind of the equivalent of thoughts and prayers after a tragedy. I think we really need to reevaluate the direction our culture is moving. Mangus the Fish says I was just on a train to Cardiff when the train stopped. Uh, there was a woman in distress and was possibly suicidal on the next platform. The train conductor called for help and stayed with her because he didn't want to just get her out the way and drive off. Thanks to that kind conductor the woman got the help she needed and is in hospital as we speak. People can complain about the delays all they want but the conductor was so right to stay with her. If you ever read this, train conductor man, thank I are so so much. This could have gone a lot worse than just an hour delay. Max Neelan says I was gonna commit suicide for a while. I had a date planned, I had a method, I had things I wanted to do and I had done it all. I had even practiced what I wanted my note to be. I had a glorious vision of people coming back to the area for my funeral and getting together again to have a good time. That's when I realized I was being delusional, no one coming to my funeral would be having a good time. They would all be miserable. No it wouldn't explain it well enough, no matter how many times I rewrote it in my head I couldn't get it so that people would understand. My mother, she would never understand, ever. So, I thought about it. Most of the shit I'm worried about, it's just shit I'm worried about. If I just stop caring about it, it would no longer be shit I'm worried about. I mean killing myself is the end, there is nothing worse that can happen to you at that point, the game is over. Maybe I just needed to start a new game, one where I was free from the shit holding me down in this one. I decided I would try one more time. I've already lost this life. I'm here, about to kill myself tomorrow, I've lost, but I can start a new game, one more fucking try. This way I can restart my life without ruining the lives of others. I mean me taking my life would ruin the lives of so many around me. I can't do that, I just want to end mine. So I did, I ended it by deciding to try again cause fuck it. What worse thing could I do that I haven't already done? The only thing is kill myself, so if I don't do that, this new life will be better than the last one. I decided to play the game, one more time. Since then I still think about suicide, 
but not multiple times a day. I don't harp on it and dream everyone would be better off without me, cause they wouldn't. My parents would be crushed. My siblings would be crushed. I would have traded my broken ass self for breaking a piece in each of them. So anyway, one more time, can't hurt any more than it did this time, right? One more time, and if I fuck up this one, it will probably be one more time again. Species Elk 77 says I attempted suicide when I was 16. I was depressed and untreated because mental illness just wasn't something that was recognized in my family. I cut my wrists and held them under water. The only thing that stopped me was the thought that my five-year-old niece would be the one to find me. I didn't want that. So I bandaged up, cleaned up, and went to lay down to re-evaluate my life. Probably should have had stitches but I wasn't ready to admit I had problems. I'm 26 now. I still struggle with my depression. I was medicated for a while, but I hated the side effects. I'm happily married, bought a house this year, and have a wonderful goddaughter who is an absolute ray of sunshine in my life. So the depression is there, but the suicidal thoughts aren't. Any time it even crosses my mind randomly, I remind myself why I'm still here. But my life is important to me. I want to live to enjoy the good times and fight through the bad. I will survive. Please, anyone that reads this, if you need help, get help. Your life is worth it. There's a lot of love and support out there if you need it. Interwave says I'm 19 years old and last week I took a fatal amount of prescription drugs hoping to end my life along with a sleeping aid so I wouldn't be awake through it. I woke up violently vomiting and extremely upset because I shouldn't be here. I still think about suicide every day, but not in a really depressed way. I feel more like I'm a background character just going with the flow not doing anything to differentiate myself from others. Atatsu says my godfather killed himself November 4, 2013. Saying he was my godfather just doesn't do it justice. He was more like an older brother to me while he was my parent age he watched me grow and acted like a kid. He loved to just come over to my house and sit down in my room for hours keeping me company and playing games with me. He marveled at the new technology that came out and how video games were evolving. And whenever he would come over when I was with friends we would all run I say hi to him and jump to give him hugs. I have a very vivid memory of showing him Super Mario Galaxy when it came out and playing on the world with the water bowl and swinging in circles on a vine. He thought it was the coolest thing in the world replying wow, this is wild. He seemed to be the only adult in my life that still wanted to keep up on what I was interested in flash forward to 2013 where I'm a junior in high school. I'm having my issues with my mom and he's been around the house a lot as he's been feeling down. I enjoyed having him here. Made the house feel more alive and he was someone I could talk to when frustrated. I wish I had known how much pain he was in. I wish I asked him how he was doing. I was not ignorant to his depression but I did not know its extent. One day I am in my room on my bed and my mother walks to the door. I already knew what she was going to say. She was crying. I knew what had happened. My mother and he were very close and during this time I became a support for my mother as well as my other family members. I was so worried about them that I feel I barely processed his death even to this day at his funeral I knew that I had to speak. He was the closest thing to an older brother I had and I wanted to say that I loved him. When I spoke everyone knew who I was. I didn't know how, but I came to find out that he had told all of the people in his life who I was, how I was growing, and the person I was turning into. It was too much for me to handle and for the first time since finding out about his death I cried. I cried through the words I spoke about how I wish he knew how much I enjoyed hanging out with him, how much I loved spending my birthdays with him or walking through rivers together. I wish I had given him a call to tell him that I loved him. I don't know if anyone will read this, please if you love someone in your life or know someone who is hurting from depression or anything, give them a hug, call them and tell them you love them. Don't wait like me. Cat6 says I have that suicidal ideation. I feel it deeply, and often, and I can honestly and openly say that I wish I wasn't alive most of the time. I also feel that reaching out and getting help will only lead to more debt, which will exaggerate a lot of my problems. I foresee that debt in the form of paying for a service to try and make me feel better or even the cost of depression medication. Then God only knows what side effects would come with that. ETC I feel trapped most of the time. I owe more than my salary in student loans. 
which means I'll likely never be able to marry or own a home or really make any decision at all that is bigger than buying a video game or two. I also can't even imagine a job exists that wouldn't be a total chore to get myself to. I work mid-level IT and make nearly zero K so technically I have it better than most. I don't mind what I do but I'll never be excited to do it. Then I spend my evenings anxious as fuck because my life is basically making sure others can access the internet, or intranet resources, or whatever I don't own myself. I couldn't choose to walk away without putting myself in a worse situation. I'm literally a hamster in a wheel and there's no way to break that loop. I want to die. Throw it away idiot says I'm in my mid-twenties, male, and I've had anxiety all my life and depression since I finished high school. Never gone to a doctor about those two though. I don't think I could ever kill myself while my parents are alive. I just couldn't bear doing that to them. They don't understand why I always play games, don't go out on the weekends or do things that people my age usually do. I haven't talked to them about it. Video games for me are an escape. While playing I don't think about anything else and time just go by fast. I'm a loner. I know many people but they're all just acquaintances nothing more, I don't get invited to any events or contacted other than if someone needs something. My social anxiety has prevented me from gaining any experience with the opposite sex. This all just adds to my depression, the sheer loneliness of my life people will often say I'm funny or great to be around or I'm always smiling but that's just me trying to hide the pain and maybe make someone else's day better. Usually the people who are always smiling are the ones that are hurting the most. I finished college a few months ago and I could care less I have zero motivation. I daydream a lot and it helps me, I daydream about a normal life of having a girlfriend, traveling the world with her, a life without anxiety and depression and what that would be like. I don't think I've ever been in a social interaction without my anxiety going through the roof. I'm just always anxious about something. Sometimes I'll stop and ask myself why is my heart racing? What am I supposed to be anxious about? Then I'll remember that it's something I have to do in a few days. I don't know what the next few years have in store for me nor where my life will take. I don't know if this is even appropriate to post here I'm second guessing myself but I'll do it anyway, I'm anxious on how someone will respond that's even going on in my head. I just felt like I needed to get it off my chest, this is actually the first time in my life I've ever expressed myself in any form on this topic. I could probably write 10 pages in detail on this. Independent Ostrich says I think someone, preferably multiple people should go through the thread and answer every plea for help. I can't do it. I'm only 14 and I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing. I've seen a lot of unanswered comments. I just wish every cry was answered. Snudge says a general message. The message of if you're feeling suicidal, contact X is kind of flawed. People who are suicidal depressed have a hard time actually reaching out and getting help. If you suspect someone close to you has issues, reach out to them. Don't make them reach out to you. Lazy Throwaway 987 says I have a question as someone who has struggled with suicidal ideation in the past. For the record I'm doing really well right now and have no depression or suicidal ideation. Can someone tell me what I should expect to happen if I am feeling suicidal and I call a suicide helpline? Will they somehow track me down and call the police? When I have been at my lowest I have fortunately never been close to attempting but I have made plans and the last time even went so far as to gather important documents, write up a sheet of info for my husband about important accounts, passwords, etc. If I get to that point again, what would be the benefit of calling a helpline? Is there anything I can do now to prepare myself in case I'm faced with that again? When I'm in a good place I am able to see the value of a helpline but when I'm at my lowest I keep it very hidden because I don't want anyone to get a clue and call the police or have me committed. What can I do to actually get myself help when I'm in that kind of place, mentally speaking? Or what can my husband do? I have been very candid with him when I'm not depressed and tell him how seriously he should take it if he ever hears me talk about ending my life. If we got to that point again, what should he do? FTC 7719 says my best friend took her own life when I was 22. Adding to that tragedy, she was several months pregnant. An emergency C-section was done at the scene. She ran her car into a tree at 90 mph, and the baby ended up dying a few hours later. 
I didn't cope. Not as in I didn't cope well. I simply didn't. I drank a lot. I got into a lot of really unhealthy relationships. I took a lot of risks of all sorts. Finally around 27 I decided to talk to a professional to deal with the grief. The wood still felt fresh after all that time I also have depression. Bipolar 2 and major depression that lasts for months, if not more than a year sometimes. In 2012 I was ready to take my own life. Meticulous planning was made to ensure success and I had all of my affairs in order. Closing internet accounts. Letters written. A sheet printed for my wife for my online financial and insurance accounts, etc. I sat in my car for a long time when I was going to do it. I thought about my wife and my father, the two people that it would affect the most. I know what living through losing a loved one to suicide is like I called the therapist that I was working with and he had me come in. I tend to avoid talking about some things. So I handed her one of the letters. She called in the supervising psychiatrist for that office and he pulled a lot of strings to get me a bed at McLean Hospital near Boston. I said that I go the next morning because I wanted to pack a few things before heading up there. He looked at me and said I can go voluntarily tonight, or involuntarily, either way. I was going that night my wife was called to take me to the hospital. I'll never forget the sheer look of pain and helplessness on her face. She's the strongest person I know and I've seen her hold her shit together in horrific situations. But she just broke down sobbing uncontrollably. She didn't know I was that bad off. Neither did anyone else. It's easier to put on the act. And I was good at acting happy. I feel tremendously guilty for causing her so much pain even to this day. I'm 40 now and glad I didn't. I wrote about it here, which oddly has been published a few times in medical journals and I did a few interviews with other psychiatric and psychology journals. Jacob O. Jensen says about a year and a half ago, I almost ended my life. I went to the hospital, and came out with nothing different. I tried again and went to another hospital. I came out of that one and got a job. I think it really helped me to have something stable in my life but I'm not going to lie and say that it's not still a struggle. Since then I've met my amazing girlfriend, but I'm still depressed and life is still hard, but that's okay. Some days I honestly do feel like trying again, but you just have to push through. M-A-Z-D-A-M-P-S-F-A-N-1 says my big brother killed himself a few weeks ago. He was a great person, and my best friend. I have no idea why he did it, but he must have felt absolutely miserable. He wasn't an idiot, quite the opposite actually, so I would think that he would get help if he had suicidal thoughts. Just a month or two ago he seemed normal, but of course we can't tell what he was thinking. When the police came to tell us that he was dead, it didn't even cross my mind that he had killed himself. It came as a big shock to everyone who knew him his friends and relatives. We all miss him very much. Morek13 says it's my birthday today. Been struggling for 5, 10 years now with severe depression. I don't know how to get better anymore. Every time I feel like progress is being made, I get hurled back to earth. I'm exhausted and just hopeless. Nothing has meaning anymore. And if nothing has meaning, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Even escapism has worn thin. I'm just at a loss. Sorry but thanks for listening. Deleted. Says I was actually stood on a bridge a few days ago contemplating suicide. I eventually walked away.